Well, welcome to Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and we're on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, we're happy to have you here with us. We are in the process of imaging uh, M1 here, and uh, what do you say we zoom in a little bit? Let's zoom in and catch a little bit closer to this object. It's kind of small in the Rasa, but... Um, See if we can grab it a little bit closer. See, did we? There we are. And uh, let's do a, um, a white balance, an auto white balance here, the best we can. Let's move our black level down a little bit, a little bit more on that crest, and then move this mid level a little bit in. And uh, See, we're imaging at 20 second exposures and a gain of 100. And perhaps you can see there in the lower right, here's a live picture of our Rasa 11 out there. And it's on a Ioptron Sim 70G mount. And uh, just checking to make sure that our um, Checking to make sure that we're our audio is good here. Yep, so audio is good. And uh, so this uh, this object is sometimes known as Cetus A. And let's go over to our planetarium software for a second, and let's. Look at the info on this. I'm sorry, M77 is what we're looking at here. Cetus A, and it is a Seifert galaxy, which means it has a rather bright nucleus whose light output varies with time. It's the only Seifert galaxy in the entire Messier catalog. And at the core of M77 is a 10 million solar mass central object, possibly a black hole. Uh, M77 is the largest member of a small galactic group that includes NGC 1055, NGC 1073, and several others. M77 is easy to locate because it's only one degree from the fourth magnitude star, Delta Ceti. A telescope will show an elongated glow with a much brighter central region, and on a good night, a telescope might begin to show a hint of spiral arms. Let's see if we can... Zero in a little bit closer here. And let's see if we can start to catch some of those spiral arms. Boy, there, I would say we're seeing some glow around it. Maybe just a little bit of a spiral arm there in the middle. Uh, here's that star that they told us about real close to this um, what is the star Delta Ceti? Let's go over to our planetarium software and we'll, we'll uh, kind of uh, zero in on what, what we're looking at here. So you can see where we are in the sky. This is not that high above the horizon. There's that, it kind of looks like almost like an elliptical galaxy. Can't see too much of that, of those arms. Now, I don't know, that, that star in this planetarium software looks like Hipparchus 12668, doesn't it? Let's back off and see if we can find, there's the Delta Ceti star down here on the right. And let me make sure that you're seeing the full screen. No, there we go. Get you guys in the full screen and make sure you can see the whole thing. Let's kind of start over. This is the planetarium software, and this is where you can see uh, the kind of like a, a sky chart of the stars. And you can see that we're looking at this uh, constellation of Cetus here. Um, this, by the way, is the photorealistic uh, horizon that we've got of 
Emerald Hills, the very site where we're observing. And you can see that we're up about uh, 22 degrees above the horizon, so not that high really. Uh, it's sometimes called the sea monster, Cetus is. And let's do an observation here. And we want to make sure we're in session 47. That's where we are tonight. And for our observing list, let's do Messier Marathon. That's the list that we're practicing on tonight. And in our notes, let's just say we, let's see, let me delete this log entry and start over here. Um, in our notes, let's say we could see the faint glow of the arms. But now let's go over and see if we can actually make out the arms. Now that's pretty, um, quite a lot of grain there, isn't it? Let's back off a little bit so we don't see that much grain. Make the sky a little bit black, a little bit more black. And see if we can make those arms there. We're starting to see a little bit of those arms. I'm going to back off the greens just a hair and then try to run these mids up a little bit. Boy, those greens are so touchy sometimes. We're not seeing a ton of the of the arms tonight, but this is definitely at least showing us the the object. And by the way, welcome to this live stream. I'm going to go ahead and um, take a snapshot of this because another thing we're trying tonight is we're trying what it would be like to do the Messier Marathon. So let's name this um, Save As and it's let's put it in um, the Sharp Cap Captures and we'll name it M77 um, and then we'll just 2022-01-25. And sometimes it's nice to have the, that's 120 seconds. So let's put in here 120 seconds. And then we'll save this. You can see the faint glow of the arms but not a ton of the spiral structure. Maybe we're starting to see a little bit of that spiral structure. Let's uh, pick out our assembly here. We're on uh, the camera, the 2600. It's a ZWOS ASI 2600. And we're in uh, session 47. Once again, our observing list is Messier Marathon. And this is the pace that we're going to have to get used to the night of the Messier Marathon. Let's take this snapshot now and let's go over to our logging software that we're going to use on the night of the Messier Marathon. And let's go down to M77. Oh, there it is, C to save. And let's click here and choose a file. And what we're going to do is go to the desktop uh, Sharp Cap Captures. And we're going to grab that file, M77, and we're going to upload it there. There we go. And that'll show that it's um, it's been uploaded. And then I'm going to say it's done. Uh, not a lot of the spiral structure. Now, this uh, sort of spreadsheet that we're using here is uh, a group spreadsheet we'll all be able to view at once and let's say we have 10 people or 15 people imaging on the night of the Messier Marathon they'll all be able to hop in here and upload images uh, simultaneously all right you see our next object here is M74 let's go over to our uh, planetarium software that's what we're going to work on next but before we go to that let's uh, oh there we're starting to see the spiral arms look at that that's much better isn't it Hope you can see that. I'm going to try to brighten it up a little bit more for you. 
Yes, now we can start to see. That's a very small object, isn't it, for the Rasa 11. But I hope you can see, we're starting to see some spiral arms and some separation between them. So let's save that exactly as seen. We don't have a name here, do we? Let's name that again, M77. I'm gonna save that one more time to make sure. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, four minutes, that's all we're gonna have on the night of the Messier Marathon. So let's stop the live stack and let's go to our sequencer that says um, next target. How about that? And with that, we'll go back to our planetarium software and slew to M74. So this is just like the Messier Marathon will be. Uh, it'll be that faster pace. Uh, now, you can see the uh, planetarium software viewing, but you can also see the Rasa 11 turned a little bit there with a the live view. And then if you look here, what we've got here is a view through a ASI, uh, MC, M, ASI, uh, see a ZWO ASI 178MM. This is a monochrome camera, but what it lets us see is kind of almost like it's an electronic viewfinder of the night sky. So that's what we use this for. We have it set on four seconds at 300 gain. Kind of lets us see the part of the sky that we're viewing. And notice that as we look at the telescope here, we're viewing with our uh, observation camera. It's one of those wise three surveillance cams, night vision. So there's no infrared being thrown at the scope. This is just pure wise three night vision. Um, it, is, it is looking as if up the north axis of the scope. And so what this means is the scope is now turned toward the west, and that is the light dome of Louisville. And you can see that light dome there. I wonder if this might be a set of those, what are they called, star, what are those telescopes called? Star something, Starlink, Starlink satellites? I said telescopes, today. Starlink satellites, and they're going to give us, I guess, low Earth orbit internet. Um, so I think that's what that is, one of those star-length array of satellites that you're viewing. Okay, let's go ba back over to our main imaging camera. And let's put in our target, which is M74. And let's do a plate solve. And you guys know what we do with plate solve. We, um, we actually compare a library of uh, photographic plates that are stored in the software associated with this imaging software and we associate that library with what the telescope is actually seeing and we compare the two and then it makes a correction if it needs to. Now it didn't make a very big correction, it's two one hundredths of a degree. So we're pretty good on our, uh, our model of the night sky but you can see a little bit of blur there where it did do a correction. Let's back off a little bit and look at the full uh, the full view of the camera, which uh, this camera format has a, a format of 6,248 by 4,176 pixels. So it's pretty, pretty. I guess you'd call that APS-C. Uh, so I think we're all set here. Let's switch our sequencer to our start imaging. And what that does is it changes the exposure to 20 seconds, changes the gain to 100, it starts the live stack. I think it clears it, but let's clear it just in case. And then we'll, we'll close that. There we go, starting a new live stack. And while that's starting the live stack, let's just say a little bit more about the scope as well. This is a Rasa 11. And let's zero in on that a little more. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger for a moment. Yeah, uh, this is sitting on top of a um, Ioptron Sim 70G mount and an Ioptron Tri-Peer, I think they call that. So it's kind of like got the peer together with a tripod and we're actually located tonight on the concrete pad where the observatory will sit once we get the observatory built. And 
That should be, Lord willing, at the end of February, beginning of March, probably second week of March, we should have that done. By the way, I see several that are in the live chat. If you'd like to say hello, just uh, tell us where you're observing from. We'd love to know where you're, um, where you're chiming in from tonight. This is a Rasa 11, Rho Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph. And the characteristic of a Rasa is that there is no eyepiece. So if we were out there tonight in the, what is it, 12 degree cold? Let's find out exactly how, how cold it is. I think we can, um, what, make all of this smaller for a second. And let's call up our, um, let's, let's call up our pocket power box software and our USB control hub. And what this software does, it lets us kind of look at what's happening on top of the telescope. And it tells us the temperature out there on top of the telescope is 17.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Relative humidity is 64%. Uh, it's calculated the dew point at seven degrees. And so what it's doing is it's using the dew strap that's around the front of the Rasa and it's zapping power to that with these dew heaters. And that's keeping dew from forming on the, the corrector plate in the front of the scope. 16.9 degrees, so that's kind of chilly, isn't it? So we're in here inside of the Emerald Hills Prayer Center and Atrium in a nice shirt sleeve, 70 degrees, and the telescope has to be out there in the cold. I'm so sorry that we're making it so hard on the telescope, but it kind of likes the cold. It's been out there before. Don, uh, great to have you here from Southwest Washington State. Good to have you here. I bet it's uh, pretty cold out there in Washington State. This Pegasus Astro USB control hub shows us the the voltage that's being applied at the USB ports and gives us a really good idea of what the USB signals are. These USB signals come down to one single entry point into an IOP, a, a, an ICRON 3124 um, remote USB extender and it actually converts the USB signal to data that can transmit over fiber optic cable. It comes in via fiber optic cable into the building here and we decode it down here with a little decoder, change it back into USB 3 signals and then uh, ramp it up into the laptop. So that's how that works. Okay, let's go back now to look at our scope. I just wanna show you one more thing. Up here on top of the scope is a little outrigger cantilevered um, uh, Los Mandy equipment plate. And on the very, very tip of that, I don't know if you can see that or not, there is a camera that actually looks at the night sky, and that's that ASI ZWO-178 monochrome camera. And back behind it are the uh, Pegasus Astro power box, it's the micro version, and the Pegasus Astro USB control hub. And they're mounted on that same equipment plate. And the cable for that comes down here and then water falls off the back of the scope. This little red light that you see here is the Celestron motorized focuser that we have on the back of the Rasa. What you can't see inside of this dew shield here in front is a ZWASI 2600MC Pro camera. That's that APS-C format camera that's on the front of the Rasa and it is the thing that's taking the place of the eyepiece. So again, the scope is pointed toward the left, which is toward the west, and we're viewing the scope like from the direction that if we were to look up, it would be headed toward the north star. That's uh, the direction that we're viewing the scope. So let's make this small again, and let's put it kind of back where it was over there in the corner. And um, I'll just sort of put it out of the way. Now let's go back to our, uh, Let's go back to our sharp cap where we've been um, saving up 14 subframes, 20 seconds each. Wow, it just reset again, didn't it? It saved an auto reset. Wow, that's not a very good deal. Auto save on clear close. Why is it resetting? Save and reset every five minutes of total exposure. We don't want to do that unless we just want to limit ourselves to five minute exposures but that way we can't see. Let's take that off so that we're not forced into that five second reset. In the meantime, let's go look and see what that, now nah, that five minute picture is not gonna look very good because we didn't have the, the auto, uh, we didn't have the color set yet. 
So let's set the color. That's much better. I wondered what happened a while ago and why that reset. Save and reset every five minutes. That must be a new setting, right? Click that on by advanced. So now we're setting the uh, black level and then we'll bring this mid level up. And that'll hopefully brighten up the middle of this image as it starts to collect frames. I'm sorry we lost those five minutes of frames. Let's go back, back to our planetarium software and let's just see the info on M74 real quick. It's a spiral galaxy. M74 is an open face spiral galaxy that looks quite remarkable in long exposure images. However, due to its low surface brightness, M74 is one of the more challenging Messier objects to observe visually. On a good night with the help of averted vision, M74 is seen as a dim smudge brightening towards the center. M74 may form a physical group with NGC 660 and several other small galaxies. So what we'll do now is we'll move this little um, information frame over and let's go back to our live view and I want to bring our telescope there in front. Let's move this up above the telescope. So we'll try to get everything situated. Now let's let's see if we can't coax a little more brightness out of this. Rats, I'm so sorry that we lost those first five minutes. I'm pretty sure if we go look at M74 in the frame where we're capturing all these images, I don't think M74 is going to be any good there because we didn't have the um, we didn't have the color balance set. It's going to be ugly. M74, but it did auto save it here. It just saved an ugly version of it. Um, 25th, yeah. Yeah, see, it was not at all uh, tuned. So that's kind of a waste there. We're going to just go ahead and delete that because it is sorrowfully ugly. And this, this frame here is also ugly. Okay, now let's go back to our... Ah, we're just starting to see the galaxy in the middle there. Let's zoom in on it. Boy, it's so, I'm going to try to darken the sky a little bit. This part of the sky does have quite a bit of light pollution from Louisville in it. Let's push, push, push. Let's see if we can't. Wow. Let's do another color balance. Just barely starting to make out the spiral arms. Darken that sky a little more. Don, uh, you might want to, you might mention if you are also an observer, uh, do you do you do uh, some kind of telescope from where you are? And why don't you tell us what kind of telescope that you use out there in Southwest Washington State? We're kind of rushing this a bit much, but as what we're doing here when we are live stacking is we're stacking frames on top of one another, and as it stacks frames, it kind of takes the best light from each frame and averages it together. And that brightens the image a bit, but we lost our first five minutes of, of time because of that little setting. It basically said save and reset every five minutes. So unfortunately, we lost our five minutes of integration uh, for, from our first view. So I'm glad we found out about that setting. See, we wouldn't want to have that happen on the night of the Messi Marathon, would we? So that's kind of what we're doing here is learning to do this. We've just got those mids pumped about as much as we're going to pump them. And this object's not going to be terribly beautiful tonight. And we're not going to spend too much longer because we've got to push on. Let's go ahead and just save a snapshot of this. We at least have located the object and we're starting to see it, but it's not very beautiful tonight, is it? Let's go with um, uh, save as 
M74 uh, for um, five minutes, 20 seconds. And it's on 2022-01-25. And um, let's go over here. Let's go ahead and close that. Let's go over here and here in this window, let's add a log and say, well, we learned the hard way that SharpCap had enabled a setting to reset after five minutes. So we lost the first five minutes of integration. But we could already see the spiral arms starting form, this target would require quite a bit more integration time. Okay, that's what we'll do tonight. And again, you can see we're barely above the trees over in that part of the sky. It's a pretty realistic view of the horizon. Let's back off a little bit so you can see that's the fence over toward that part of the sky. And there's one of our prayer shelters. You can see the ground is a little bit kind of worked up here. Wow, so Don, you've got your scope going with a Williams Optic GT81, an ASI 533MC Pro, and a Rasa 8. That's awesome, waiting for first light. Well, we'll look forward to seeing some of your images. Um, so we'll, we'll back off here and you can see a little bit more of the horizon, a little road that goes back there. This is what the horizon really looks like and see how low we are to the horizon here with M74. Let's go to the next object. First, we'll go back to, ah, look, you can see a little more of, a little bit more. Let's make the sky just a shade blacker and then pull in as much data as we can. That's what they call out when we say stretch things. We're, we're pulling in as much data as we can. But that's what we're going to do for M74. So let's stop the live stack now and again use our sequencer to switch to the next target. And now let's go over here to our uh, uh, planetarium software and let's say slew to the pinwheel galaxy. While that's slewing, let's make sure you're seeing our um, 178 mono camera and that you're also seeing the scope as it turns. So you're able to see the scope turning real time here in the lower right corner. And there it's kind of crossing that north meridian uh, because you see we knew that because we are our surveillance camera was kind of looking down the rifle sight, so to speak, when it looked in the north. Now it's pointing over toward the right, which would be east, and looking up there in the nighttime sky in the east. And you can see the, uh, the 178 that, that scrolled with it. Actually, here you can make out the Big Dipper. I don't know if you can see that totally well, but there's the handle of the Big Dipper and the Dipper itself. And... This window that's lit up here is actually the window where I'm sitting. That's the office where I'm sitting. This is the front of our prayer center and atrium building. So kind of You're able to see our facility there, and that's the window where I'm sitting. Let me just show you quickly what that looks like. I'm going to go over and turn off the light of that office. When I do, you'll see that light go off. There's a little delay in the live stream. So you see that light go off? And now just so I can see what I'm doing, we'll turn that light back on. So that's the office where I'm sitting and where we're observing. And now let's go back over to the planetarium software. Well, first let's go and start the live stack. That's a better use of our time. Let's go back out to the full auto first. And uh, as you can see, if we just looked at this with a one-shot exposure, <clears throat> there's not much we can see. So we're going to change this to 
start imaging and that's going to change again that exposure time to 20 seconds the gain to 100 and it's going to start the livestock and it's finished so we can let's clear this just to be sure yeah oh and let's change our name this is the pinwheel galaxy is that 101 remind me uh, let's show the info on that 99 m99 so let's change our name to m99 and we'll move this information deal over and say yes um, okay so we've got 20 seconds there on m99 let's look at a description of this m99 is a face-on spiral galaxy in the virgo cluster Long exposure photographs show two prominent spiral arms that can be seen visually in large telescopes. Smaller telescopes show a large spherical halo with a bright core, but other details difficult to discern. You know what I think we're going to do is stop this livestock for a second and do a plate soft to make sure we're looking in the right spot. Because, uh, you know, this is a different part of the sky and this is just our second or third target and maybe when we slewed to this part of the sky maybe there would be a correction that we would have to make because we don't do any auto like three star alignment thing we just do a polar alignment and then we just start and go to the first image it did it had uh, oh just 14 one hundred so not a very big um, not a very sh very big shift but this way we'll make sure that the object is right in the center of our field of view and that's a good thing. So now it's synced and that'll make for a better model and now let's start that live stack again and clear the previous one. Okay, now back to our description. M99 is a face-on spiral galaxy in the Virgo cluster. Long exposure photographs show two prominent spiral arms that can be seen visually in large telescopes. Smaller telescopes show a large spherical halo with a bright core, but other details difficult to discern. M99 is very asymmetric, possibly due to a past encounter with another galaxy. So the tidal forces kind of pulled it apart. It is the largest recorded velocity of any Messier object moving away from us at 2300 kilometers per second. That's interesting. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we've changed directions in the sky and so the Louisville light dome is no longer as big on this part of the sky. Now we're looking away from Louisville toward the east. So we'll do a new color balance. And you can see it shows to increase the greens and drop the reds and the blues. Let's take our black level down and find that peak so we get as many colors as we can and then let's take our mids <clears throat> begin pushing them now we're starting to see what might be an object there in the very middle see yeah uh, i don't like <clears throat> the way this is looking with all those purples but that's just because we're pushing the mids so much Let's zoom in because this is going to be a very small object. Oh yeah, there we are. So you can see a little bit of those arms. Boy, I tell you, I'm I'm not happy with the way the colors are. Oh, that's a little bit better color match now. Now let's push the greens a little. Let's push the mids a little higher. Yeah, now you're starting to see at just 120 seconds you're starting to see some of those spiral arm structures and this is the way it should be i like this because it's looking away from the louisville city lights and we can see a little bit better what we're looking at wow we have several folks that have joined us on the live stream if you'd like to say where you are that's helpful because we can kind of see where in the world you're watching from uh, while you're doing that Let's go back to the uh, planetarium software and um, for just a moment, let's kind of back off the night sky. 
I think I'm going to turn on the constellations for a moment, and we'll see all the constellations around this area. So you see, this is a Big Dipper that we were seeing in this view from our 178. Now there goes an airplane across our lower left. Look at that, that airplane. And the airplane is smeared because these are four second time exposures. So that's a four second flight of that airplane. So here's the Big Dipper here. And now let's go back and look at our planetarium software. There's a the Big Dipper there, see? Now this is Leo. So let's look for this triangle. And then here is the body of Leo. There's Regulus. It goes up and this is the head, the head of the lion. Okay, so let's look for this triangle in our 178. Okay, I see it. Here's the triangle, right? And there's the body going up to Regulus. Here's Regulus and there's the top. Now there, I think those are some of those Starlink satellites, I believe. And the reason why I say that is because see how they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in a row that are traveling across the night sky. So our object is right here in the middle. And what we'll do now is go back to our planetarium software and let's zoom in on our object, which is M99. And when we do, we're going to see now, notice what will happen is our planetarium software, up it, it actually downloads the pictures of the stars for this part of the sky. And when it gets those downloaded, sometimes you see those stars, they kind of snap into better focus. And then in the middle is this pinwheel galaxy. There, the stars just snapped into better focus. Now, look at this pinwheel galaxy. You can kind of see why they call it the pinwheel galaxy. See how it looks like a pinwheel? But now look how this one arm is indeed asymmetric. It's been thrown out. There's Frank, uh, and he's pulling out his French on us uh, because uh, Etienne is speaking to us from Quebec with a hot cup of coffee. And so Frank is, is greeting Etienne in uh, good French there. Way to go. Uh, Frank, appreciate you doing that. And of course, Frank is uh, logged on from Schenectady, New York. Frank, I hope you've got uh, uh, clear skies there tonight and that you've got a telescope aimed at the sky. Looks like D-Man is there from Arizona. D-Man, you've been with us before. And if I remember right, you've got some great gear. I think you've got, do I remember right that you've got like a 14-inch Rasa or something? I mean, it's. if I remember right, you have great, great gear going on there. Uh now let's go back to the live view. Right now you're looking at the planetarium software. But uh, let's go back to the live view now. And that is right here. And again, we'll, we'll try to pump up our mids a little bit more. Boy, with the help of the imagination and the uh, planetarium software that we just saw, can you make out barely that arm? I'm going to enlarge it to 300% just for a second. Now, it's going to be pixelated, but look how you can sort of make out that arm. That's not pretty, is it? Because we got a little pixelation going on. We're actually enlarging the pixels larger than they're meant to enlarge, but look how we can start to see this arm that's asymmetrical there. Tomorrow night is your night. Oh, good, Frank. And D-Man says, yes, he does have a 14-inch Rasa. Wow, that would be super cool. All right, let's go back to our realistic. Okay, we're at uh, seven minutes. And for the Messier Marathon, this is going to have to do. So what I'm going to do is kind of pump up this data as much as we can. And for the sake of the Messier Marathon, let's grab a, a picture of this. We're just going to grab this little screenshot and this is m99 so we'll save this save as m99 and we'll say seven minutes on 2022 uh, 01 
25. And then we're also going to, let's close this. We're also going to save the sharp cap. That's actually looking okay there, isn't it? Not beautiful, but okay. And let's do a um, an observation here and say we could see the asymmetric. How do you spell that? Asymmetric? Two S's maybe? Um, uh, spiral arm as if it had slung out uh, material from the center of the pinwheel. How about that? And then we'll close that. I'm just going to copy that text because what we're also experimenting with tonight this is M99. We're also going to our Messier Marathon um, uh, software. So what I'm going to do is go grab our picture of M74 now. And we'll just go down here and say M74. Let's just grab that one. And we'll put it there. And then we're also going to grab our picture of Oh, look, M99 is where the list went in the order that we got it from our planetarium software. But M99 is not there. So let's do a search up here in the search bar for 99. There we are. So this is where we want to save this. M99, and um, again, we're going to go back to this and grab that little snapshot I just did. Okay, so there's M99. So if we were doing this for the Messier Marathon, it has us observing that actually in the morning. That's odd, isn't it? Whereas right now, our planetarium software had the order set to observe it tonight. Anyway, wow, that's a little bit better now, isn't it? Let's keep that night sky black. Look how our color shifted toward, somehow it shifted toward a reddish purple, didn't it? And now it's shifting toward a blue. But now it's, let's just do a new color balance. Not much better. Sharp cap itself is having a hard time balancing the color on this object. But look at that. We're actually able to see the pinwheel structure this way, at least now. Wow, that's a much better view of the, at least the core structure, isn't it? Let's do another. And let's say 11 minutes. This is too long. We're taking too long on this object. <laughs> this is uh, M99, um, nine minutes on 2022 0125. Okay, now we stop. Um, and let's change our sequencer to next target and go back now. Now this says Andromeda Galaxy for our next target. So let's slew to Andromeda. While that's slewing, we'll let you look at the um, night sky through the 178. We'll bring the um, the view of the telescope around so you can kind of watch it slew and then lower right there. Does this kind of make you dizzy? By the way, tonight we we kicked off the first use of um, our new rig rack. And we have a little video that we ran of that. It's just a little one minute short video that you can watch uh, later. What utility was that for the screen capture? Oh, I'm glad you asked. That is called, because I love this, and it is uh, freeware, it's called 
share X. So it's the word share with the letter X. And it's freeware and it's available on all platforms. And I love this uh, screen capture utility. It does so many things. I'm just barely scratching the surface of it. So there is our view of the light dome of Louisville. That's Bortle 6 Sky here. There goes another airplane or two. Those might be those satellites, who knows, but at least maybe another couple airplanes. And somewhere up there is supposed to be the Andromeda Galaxy. So let's go back now to um, our, oh yeah, we're gonna see the Andromeda Galaxy, aren't we? Let's do another, oh wait, let's back our auto out to auto. And we don't have to plate solve that because look, we're right, I can see the Andromeda's core right there in the middle. So let's change our sequencer now to start imaging. And I don't think I have the clear, I gotta put the clear command in there in the sequence because I don't think it's clearing the, the live stack. And let's change this to M31 for the Andromeda Galaxy. And wow, it's 20 seconds at 100. Let's do a color balance and move our mids up. It's because we're back in the light dome of Louisville. Now we're in a completely different view of the night sky. And let's bring our mids up. Um, I would try a little more gain, Doug. You'll be surprised. I know 100 is the optimum setting, but that's for astrophotography to get the highest dynamic range. Wow, Andromeda, nice. More gain will cause the integrations to build faster. No need to bump gain for M31. Okay, gotcha. We'll do that. Um, now keep in mind, this is in the light dome of Louisville. But I'll tell you what's in our favor tonight, that moon has not risen yet and it doesn't rise until around one. So it's as if we have a total moonless night. Even though the moon is gonna be strong, what is it like 50% still, uh, we don't see it until 1 a.m. tonight, so that's good. Uh, in this image, you can see not only the Andromeda galaxy and we're also starting to see this dust lane already, but you can also see M32 here and M110 here. So those are already starting to form up. So three galaxies in one view here. M31, M32, and M110. Let's go over to here to our um, planetarium software and you can see that. M31 here, M32 there, and M110 there. And if we just look at the info about the Andromeda Galaxy, it says, the Andromeda Galaxy is one of the most magnificent objects in the night sky, and undoubtedly the most famous galaxy outside our own Milky Way. Now let's go over and show you the live view while our object is forming uh, in the live stack. Uh, easily visible as a hazy patch to the naked eye, uh, the galaxy covers as much of the sky as five full moons put together. Kim, welcome from Australia. You spoil us, Kim, by dropping in like this from all the way around the world. Binoculars will show Andromeda in its entirety with a clear brightening towards the center Binoculars will also show two of Andromeda's companion galaxies, M32 right here and M110 right here. Careful observation of the nuclear region. That doesn't mean it's going to blow up. It means the nucleus, the middle core, with a telescope will reveal faint dust lanes and other structures. The Hubble Space Telescope has shown that the Andromeda galaxy has a double nucleus, indicating that it might have cannibalized another galaxy at one time or another. M31 was once thought to be a nebula inside our galaxy, but in 1923, an astronomer, Edwin Hubble, showed that it lies outside the Milky Way. M31 is now thought to be about 2.9 million light years away, 
It's over 150 light years across and has a mass of 1.2 trillion times that of the sun. 150,000 light years is what? About 50% bigger roughly than the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a huge galaxy. Let's zoom in. I think we can zoom in maybe to the 25%, maybe actually even. You know what else I have tonight? I have this new mouse. Let me switch over here for a second. And I'm going to use the webcam to show you my new mouse. If you were with me the other night, you remember that my trackpad gave me fits. And it was because I had cleaned it with some Purell. And the Purell is just outside my reach over there. Some of the hand cleaner. Don't clean your trackpad with Purell before a live stream. That is not very effective. Uh, so what it did is it basically rendered the mount unusable. And uh, for two hours, I struggled. And so I ordered this mouse, and I am looking forward to trying it out. I've never really used a separate mouse. But one thing I think it'll gain us is a wheel for the zoom. So I think once I click here, right, oh, instead it controls the up and down movement. It doesn't zoom in and out in SharpCap. I'm going to have to experiment. How do I get the, the wheel to let me control the zoom rather than scooting up and down in this frame? Somebody's going to be able to tell me that, I bet. Um, I notice, uh, D-Man, you're, li you're asking, are we liking Starry Night Pro better than Sky Safari? <clears throat> yes. The answer is yes for many reasons. I've actually started a thread on Cloudy Nights. Uh, you guys that aren't on Cloudy Nights, that's a forum for amateur astronomers and professional astronomers alike. And the title of my thread is A Thousand Reasons Why I Like Starry Night Pro. Uh, and I'm, I'm logging that one at a time, and I'm actually making videos about it. And in the process of making the videos, I'm also making them into tutorials because very few people had done tutorials about Starry Night Pro, surprisingly. Even though it's like 20 years old, there were very few tutorials on it on the web. So I'm building this list of tutorials. You can go to the Emerald Hill Skies. I'll try to, maybe I'll add the, the link later to this live stream. Up in the upper right, I'll add the link so you can actually see them. But um, a zillion reasons I'm loving Starry Night Pro. One of the most obvious is you don't have to cheat and operate within Alpaca server or BlueStacks and use the, the Android version to be able to show it in Windows. That's just, I just got the point that that was just so much extra trouble and it dropped sometimes. It dropped connection sometimes. So I'm really loving Starry Night Pro because it is native Windows. That's one reason. And there are a thousand others. Okay. Let's do one more thing. Let's make our sky a little bit blacker. And then let's do another color balance. Keep our sky black and let's push the mids so we can start to see this dust lane and basically some more that's going on there, if we zoom in, you can see some more material here. This is in the lights of Louisville. I'm gonna try my mouse. Look at that. See how we're starting to see some splotchy, that's like dust and uh, soot that's uh, blocking our sight from some of those stars. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful galaxy, but boy, the being in the light dome of Louisville is reducing our ability to show its contrast with the night sky. Hold control while you scroll the wheel. Yes, I knew someone would help me do that. I'm going to hold the control. Frank, you are my friend. How did you know how to do that? How did you know that, Frank? 
That's so helpful. That if I let go, I can go up and down. Oh, this is just too good to be true. Boy, I, I'm going to have to shoot new darks. Look, here's a, a hot pixel that's not being captured in my dark frame that I'm subtracting. I use these calibration frames called darks and flats that we shoot in advance. And there's a new hot pixel. That's so strange because I am chilling. I am chilling. Let's move this just a little bit. Um, too many things at once here to look at, huh? I'm chilling to minus eight. And we've got a hot pixel there haunting us. That's so sad. Hold down control to zoom in. I love this. You know, I think I might be converted. Um, Frank's laughing. Yep, I wondered why you used the drop down list for Zoom. <laughs> it's because I've never had a mouse. <laughs> I've always used the trackpad and just never. Wow, that's so great. Okay, nine minutes. We got to go. We're spending too much time. So let's save a exactly a scene. And I think that's probably pretty good for Andromeda. But you know what? We'll do one of those. screenshots too for the sake of posting it in Notion and I'm going to say save as look at me using a mouse I've never done this um, we're going to say M31 M32 M110 2022 <laughs> and let's insert that this is 10 minutes 10 minutes Okay, we'll let that we'll let that percolate just a little longer while we go over in a notion, like we'll have to do on the night of the Messia Marathon. And now what if so this is not doing anything in the scroll? Oh, that's because I have a search active. So there's the Andromeda. Now Tom had already posted a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy, so I'm gonna add mine as well. Oh, that's a confusing thing, isn't it? Add a file, choose the file, and then I'm going to go to desktop sharp cap. And it didn't take me back to M31, and the one I want is this. Wow, was that the picture we took? That really looks good. Look at that. That couldn't have been the picture. That's probably the one Tom took. Yes, that's definitely the one Tom took. I think that's more like astrophotography. That's longer than we integrated. Because this is our 10-minute version here, I think. <laughs> no fair. we got to ask Tom how long he spent on that. <laughs> that's okay. We don't mind him doing a little bit more. Uh Doug's version is 10 minutes and Bortle 6. Now I'm jealous of Tom's version. Okay. Let's go back here and boy, with that light dome that's all we're going to get out of this. Stop, Doug. Stop, stop. Move on. Uh, save exactly a scene. Boy, it's just not as pretty as the version Tom had in dark skies with longer integration. Um, so we're going to stop the live stack. Let's go to the next target. And then let's come back and um, do quick... Um, quick observations of these for the sake of Starry Night Pro. So here we are. We're going to go to M52 next, and that's at 20 degrees. And then let's go to our electronic viewfinder, so to speak, and let's watch the scope slew. 
Didn't sleep very much, did it? We didn't have to change. We're still looking at that north-northwest view of the night sky. And you can see this light dome. That's just headed right into the light dome of Louisville. So that's why it's not a very pretty sight. Let's back off a little bit and get a picture of what, what we're looking at here. This is M52, right? Yeah, M52. And that's our, that's our photorealistic horizon in Starry Night Pro. So you can kind of see we're, we're close to the horizon. You can see those trees. And uh, what we're looking at here is a cluster. So this, this should show up well, even though uh, there's a light dome there. I think we'll do better with the cluster. So let's go back and change the name to M52. You notice tonight, what I've done is I've arranged the screen so that the target list is over here on the right. So I can constantly see what's going to be the next target we're going to. And I can check these as we observe them. And that shows that they're, you know, done. And so I can see at a glance where we are in the order. So that lets me know that we're M52. And then I'll take our sequencer and say um, start imaging. And I'm going to clear... Maybe it does clear. Do you think it clears the, that it looks like it did clear it for us, didn't it? Starting the sequence, set gain, set exposure, start live stacking. Hmm. Yeah, it did clear it. So look, right away we've got this beautiful cluster, even with, you know, 20 seconds. We didn't really have to live stack at all. So I'm going to zoom in to about maybe, oh wait, I forgot. We can use our new mouse. Look at that. That's so fun. And I'm going to shoot a, um, a snapshot of this and say save as and call it M52 with 60 seconds on 2022-01-20. Well, now it's 26. So M52. And we'll let that live stack while we go over here to Notion, which is what we're going to use for the Messier Marathon. And here's M52, the Scorpion, it's called. Choose a file. Um, look how it's not saving the place where I am. That's bothersome. M52. And we'll grab that one. And once we've added the image, I need to remember to say, Doug, you know what I don't have? I don't have um, my name in the in the file name. So we'll, we'll have to remember to tell people that, huh? Or else it doesn't separate and let you see one image from the next, huh? Chris, Mr. Another, we are so glad you're here all the way from Germany, 6 a.m. there. Welcome. We've exchanged messages on cloudy nights, Chris, and we're glad you're there. Please tell us what kind of scope you have. I forget what kind of scope you're using. Wow, we need to go at a faster pace, don't we? Uh, but some of these we've done, like for instance here, we would just grab M31, the M31 image we made a while ago that had all three targets, and that gives us M32. So I'd put my name, and then I would say check and then I do it again here just to show that it's why doesn't that remember the folder that I'm using M32 
M31, sorry. That's uploading. So this is the way the Messier Marathon could look that night. I put my name there, then I check. That object's done. Okay, now we're ready to go to see. M52 is done. Uh, let's go back to Sharp Cap and stop that. Save a scene. You know what? Let's do a better color balance. And let's do this right. Put our blacks there. Bring our mids in. You know, that focus is no longer perfect. In a minute, we might have to stop and focus. Now let's save exactly scene. It's a brand new 10 inch Richie Crescien. I sent you a picture by mail today. I can't wait to see that. A 10 inch RC, that's gonna be fun. All right, let's stop this live stack, but let's do our sequencer and go to next target. Um, over here, let's say SLU to M103. Let's back off of this view so we can see a little bit more of the sky. Let's go back to show the telescope view moving and let's look at our kind of electronic viewfinder here. This is our ASI 178. And we just got there for the last of the view. You can see how the telescope now is pointing north, northwest. So look, here's the Big Dipper. And look at the pointer stars. So that must be Polaris, and here's the Little Dipper. Can't make out quite as much of the Little Dipper in the sky glow of Louisville. And then here's Cassiopeia. And we lose some of Cassiopeia. But there we can make out that W pattern. Okay, let's go back to um, the planetarium software. And M103 is our target here. And it's another open cluster. I'm just watching those stars for a minute because I'm hoping and trusting that they pop into a little bit more sharpness because what we have now is Starry Night Pro Plus. And with the plus view, we're no longer seeing simulations of stars with the plus view. We're actually seeing, look at that. That is a real picture of the Milky Way. And as we zoom through, it uploads additional resolutions because we, we view it at different resolutions. And as we zoom in, we, we change to a different resolution, allegedly. And this should be, you know, one of the sharpest resolutions we're seeing, but it hasn't loaded in. What that means is probably our internet is so busy with the live stream that that Starry Night Pro is taking its time uploading that image. But when we upload these images and, and we get that on a hard drive, the next time it won't have to upload it again. And this will be a, a nice tight image uh, that's actually a, 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 an image of the night sky. Anyway, let's go to 103 in the ASI 2600 view. So this is M103, and right there it is in the middle. So really, we don't need to live stack. We can just say, there is that cluster. Is that the best focus we can do? Oh my goodness. That's, we need to focus again, don't we, gang? So sorry, uh, I'm going to disconnect the, 2600 and I have to actually leave sharp cap so it'll let go of the focus motor go into Nina Papa Tech oh we're so sorry you've got rain tonight you're always kind of 
telling us how great the skies are there and how warm it is. <laughs> sorry you've got rain tonight. <laughs> yes. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean that. No, we wish you had clear skies. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> so what I'm doing is connecting the focus motor and the camera here in Nina. And we're going to go to the imaging frame and do a new autofocus so that we can clear up those little donuts that we were starting to see. While we're clearing up those donuts, let's go over to uh, Sharp to uh, Starry Night Pro Plus and let's catch up on anything else we missed. Let's see. We did our observation here, didn't we? Yes, 125. Now, if I go here and I show info for this, does it just replace? Yeah. And there's, we did. Now, did we do pinwheel? Yes. And did we do Andromeda? No. So let's do a an observation here for Andromeda. Actually, our view of Andromeda, Andromeda wasn't as good as the one Tom had posted in Notion posted. Is that a case where I'm going to have to delete this log entry? You know, I told those guys at Simcur, this is a bit of a glitch <laughs> uh, in Notion. Um, wasn't as good as the one Tom had posted in Notion, but we have to ask how long was his integration? How long, how many minutes had he viewed? Um, still, we could see dust lanes and structure of the spiral arms. But we were a little envious <laughs> of the longer integration. That's the way we're going to explain it. All right. OK, now I don't know if I have to close that or not. Um, oh, look, it's actually kept the others open. <laughs> it doesn't replace them. So let's go to M32 now and just do Wow, this is our first observation logged of M32. This companion of M31 shows up as a, what would you call it? A glob or smudge. Um, it looks more like an elliptical galaxy. Let's go back over here to description. Oh, look, that's because it is. <laughs> Duh. It looks more like the elliptical galaxy th that it is. <laughs> OK, that's funny. And then let's uh, do observation of 110. Um, we could plainly see 110 as a smudge in the very first frame of the M31 field of view, something like that. And again, it looked more like an elliptical. Does elliptical have two L's? Elliptical? No, I think just one. Let's go over and see what kind it is. Elliptical. It does have two L's. Now we know. Boy, that didn't look like to put. OK. So we did 110. Uh, one hour. What does that mean, Papa Tech? You've got one hour till the rain clears? Oh, are you the one who took M31? Now I don't feel so bad. That's a 90-minute picture of M31. So you are the you are Tom who put that in notion. Do you know how bad my image looked compared to yours, Tom? That's just no fair. 
how can that be with EAA that you spent 90 minutes, you rascal? <laughs> okay, so M52, you're not a rascal. I'm just joking. Nobody says that you can't do longer amount of time with... <laughs> Uh, we don't have an observation yet for this. M52. This was our open cluster, wasn't it? So let's just do... This was a pretty little open cluster, but we moved past it quickly. <laughs> you know, that's a shame because I'm sure that we should have stayed on it and appreciated the beauty more. And then M103... Is that where we are right now, I think? We're imaging him. Oh, no, we went back to um, focusing. You know, if you're on the live stack, and I see several people are that haven't logged on, haven't told us where you are, you're kind of lurking out there. So if you are just watching, what we're doing right now is we're, <clears throat> we're auto-focusing using this software called Nina, and it, it has a plug-in designed to help you autofocus. And in case this is your first time to see, I'll just do the 60 second explanation. It takes a picture, moves the mirror back. Uh, in other words, it, it looks at a different focus point by moving the mirror back. Takes another picture, compares the two, and it's it tries to decide which one has less light is what it's boiling down to. It's the half flux radius measurement of how much luminance there is in all these points of light. And it's taking lots and lots of stars that are mostly in the center part of the of the the way I have it set up, the center part of the picture. And it's measuring, do we gain light or lose light? Then it moves the mirror back a little more. In other words, it focuses a little farther away, takes another picture, compares, moves a little farther away, takes another picture. And then what you see this graph is, this is a graph of a hyper, of a of a hyperbola of what happens to the amount of luminance. And theoretically speaking, because sharp focus means that the stars are finer points of light, there is less luminance in the half flux radiance measurement. So what you see here is a measurement of the fact that the focus motor detected, that the software detected that when the focus motor moved out, it picked up more luminance. So it now set the focus here at the lowest point. Now that is a beautiful curve, isn't it? We're, we're not seeing a big variation. That should have resulted in a great focus. So let's move back to our equipment here and un, and see, disconnect from the camera and the focuser, the focus motor, and then Close Nina. And that's all the longer it takes to focus. Even though we're sitting 200 feet away from the telescope, we don't have to go out and do a bottom off mask. We don't have to come back then and use our visual, which is not as good, if you ask me. Uh, we're not as good at visually focusing a, a Rasa telescope because it has such a narrow um, critical focus zone. The critical focus zone, I'm told, for a Rasa is 11 microns. And that's not 11 millimeters. That's 11 microns, which is some insane fraction of a millimeter. It's so thin that it's half the width of a human hair is the critical focus zone. So that's how exacting the focus has to be for a Rasa 11. And I just can't do it with my eyes. I mean, I'm just telling you, it's not exacting enough. So Frank says, what did you use for that M31, Tom? And Tom says, a little cheating. When I was working through other issues with the ASI Air Pro, he used the Evil Star 72 with a ZWO 533 at Bortle 6 Skies. Boy, it is a beautiful image. I'll tell you that much, Tom. <laughs> now, just remember, to count for the Messier Marathon, the images have to be taken on the night of the Messier Marathon. Did we save an image of M103? Somebody tell me. Did we save that? Let's go look for a second. I can't remember if, if we imaged M103 or if we saw that the focus was so bad and we didn't image it. You know what? 
I don't ever show that I've ever observed M103 yet, so I'm pretty sure I didn't. So let's put M103 here in the target name box, and let's in the sequencer let's say start imaging and it looks like we don't have to clear yeah so we're zoomed to 75 percent there boy look how much sharper those are now look at that wow look how much the focus improved look at that little tiny star right there i mean that might be a magnitude 15 16 star there and it's i don't even know if it's showing up on youtube but we're picking it up now this is like incredibly tack sharp pinpoints it's amazing so let's back off this thing to about 50 so we can see the big picture of this cluster yeah it's kind of lost in the background stars because there's so many stars in this star rich region anyway when you zoom in you almost you almost lose it don't you so this is enough let's go ahead and capture this and that's m103 file save as Oh, good, it kept the place. Um, M103, and that's just 80 seconds on 2022 Now, we should get in the habit of saying, Doug. That should be in our file name. Um, might as well let that accumulate while I go upload this real quick. M103. There's M103. Uh, is your focus motor capable to perform such little steps? Oh, yeah. Sesto Senso, and it can move seven microns per time. Yeah, I think it is. Um, this focus motor has something like 35,000 steps to it. So it is incredibly fine uh, tuning. I'll have to calculate that. That's a very good question, Tom. Chris, I'm sorry, Chris, that's a very good question. Oh, so you're throwing M51 in there. That way we can see what it's like when we're, when we're dual banjoing. Uh, so there's 103, it's checked. Uh, let's go back to this and say, save exactly as seen. Stop the live stack. Now see we're moving on. Uh, let's slew to the little dumbbell. Let's back off of our sky so we can see. Boy, it didn't move much, did it? If at all. Yeah, same part of the sky. Let's zoom in. M76 is the little dumbbell. Um, it hasn't downloaded our hasn't downloaded our picture of this part of the. So let's go over here and make it M76 sorry M76 Put our sequencer on start imaging. I wish I knew if that cleared the live stack. But I'm clearing it just in case. Uh, it's a Celestron, Chris. 
Thanks for asking. Doug and I both have, yeah, Celestron, right. So look, we can already see the little dumbbell there. That's exciting. Uh, let's do a color balance. And let's move our blacks over to right there. Boy, you can see that light dome of Louisville. Let's zoom all the way in. I'm so glad we focused because I would be super embarrassed right now if we hadn't. Man, the little dumbbell is a very difficult target for EAA with a wide field of view like a Rasa 11. First of all, because it's such a small target, let's find out what the um, arc size is. Sometimes you have to minimize these. So we're going to go to little dumbbell info, other data. 2.7 arc minutes. Now to put that in perspective, I think my field of view with the Rasa is like 1. I'm looking it up if you hadn't already guessed because I've forgotten it. Please forgive me. I should have this memorized. Um, should be here on this should be here on the screen somewhere calculated hmm hmm <laughs> here 2.17 by 1.45 Got to memorize that. How embarrassing that I had to look that up. 2.17 by 1.45. So to put that in perspective, that means that this field of view is 2.17 wide by 1.45 high. So one and a half degrees high. Each degree has 60 minutes. So that would be 90 minutes high. And the size of this target is 2.7. So that's 3% of our field of view. <laughs> it's a very small target in this Rasa frame. But such as it is, we can still make it out, and you can see the color variation, can't you? It does change to red here on the end. It's green in between. Mike, Jerry, welcome. You can see it's green here in between. We're at 100%, but I tell you what, I'm going to violate the rules and go to 300%, just so we blow it up a little more. And again, you can see this is one of those, you know, if this were a person, it would be bipolar. <laughs> That's the truth. Not making fun or anything, but you can see that it is a bipolar structure. And the way these, uh, uh, the way these planetary nebulae things are form is that a star starts giving off its material as it dies, its, its final phase of life. And it gives off so much finally that the part that's left becomes sort of like white dwarfish and gives off light again. And so it sends out its light and that light strikes the, the chemistry that it had given off. All that hydrogen and whatever, helium or whatever that it jettisoned. Uh, oxygen maybe in some cases if it's turning green. And then when the light hits it, it ionizes it and lights it up and makes it like Christmas lights for us. This one's even red and green. How about that? So this is 4 minutes and 40 seconds. That's actually pretty pretty good for a messy Messier marathon practice level 
It's kind of what we want. Now look how we're seeing material being thrown out the side as well as out the ends. Now that's interesting. And we're seeing that with our actual observation. That's not something that we saw first in a planetarium software. But now let's go to the planetarium software. Where is the planetarium software? Here it is. And let's zoom in on this. Actually, that picture is not showing us as much. Let's go to uh, an actual M76 nebula and let's look at images of it that astrophotographers have taken for 90 minutes like Tom does sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to get this out of the way and bring these back. Look at this material that's being jettisoned out. Can you believe that we were seeing that? Look, you can see it here. Wow. Look here in this picture. We saw these bipolar things, and then we were also starting to see this material already. And that was after just six minutes. I love EAA. I just love it. We did a scientific observation in six minutes. When you do the marathon, what is the optimal amount of time to stay on a target to conform recognition? <laughs> you know, Tom, when you do the marathon, the secret is to get it done. And there are 110 objects. So if you have three guys imaging, there are times, now not always, but there are times in the night that the optimal time is probably three minutes. Now, if you have a luxury of 10 guys, then the optimal time might become six minutes because we'll spread out the targets. If we had 20 guys, then we could do some of your longer, I don't know if we can afford to do 90 minutes, Tom, but we could do, you know, we could do 10 minute, 12 minute images and they'd all be beautiful. Um, this is seven minutes, and we're already seeing these, whatever you would call those. What would you call those? Nodes? Strown material? <laughs> what would you call those? Those other nodes that are thrown out in that, like big ears. We're actually seeing them. So we saw that in seven minutes and 40 seconds. It's not defined by a tight amount of time. The... SEDS people, S-E-D-S, that keep track, they don't even make you do images because they have a lot of people using binoculars and uh, small telescopes without cameras. So you don't have to image anyway. As long as you can see the object, log it. We just image it to go one step further, you know. So I'm going to do that. Control, print screen, grab a close-up snapshot of this. This is M76 at 8 minutes. M76 at 8 minutes. 2022-01-26 now. And it's dug. So that's probably what we should be putting on these. All those things that I just put. Now let's go over to Notion. Find M76. It's next in line on this list and go back to that M76. Wow, look at all the pictures I have of M76. That. And in this square, say Doug. In this square, say Done. In this square, say Wow. In six minutes, we were already seeing the, now I hope you're going to tell me what to call those. Ear-like nodes shooting out in loops from the 
side of the barrel object, which I think is amazing. Uh, Tom, you're also asking, are we going to divide up the targets? I have very little access to the south, but good west to east. Yeah, I, I think the way it will probably happen is, first of all, there will be video Zoom going on with all of us. And you'll just hear Frank say, has anybody got M76 yet? And nobody will speak up. And Frank says, okay, I'm going after M76. Um, there'll be a little bit of that, just informally, you know. But the other thing that'll happen is when we look at this notion list now, we'll see which targets are left. And we could go ahead and say, Doug's going to get this one and put our name there. And that sort of claims it to let people know I'm working on that target right now. And it's going to take me seven minutes, but I'm working on it. So we could put our name there first. How about that? Um, just because somebody puts their name there, it doesn't mean you can't also do that target. But at least that would divide up the workload a little bit, wouldn't it? Okay, I'm going to add a log entry here and say, wow, we saw the ear-like nodes extending from the side. I don't remember seeing these so quickly six minutes previously. I just don't think I ever had an image that good of See, look, in this image that we've now downloaded, and it's, it's the fine image from uh, Starry Night Pro Plus, these are the lobes that we're starting to see. And they do look like giant ears. And our barrel is every, every bit as good as this one. In fact, we have better reds and better greens than what this image has. Our ears are still sh sort of forming, aren't they? Let me darken the sky just a little bit, and that'll make our ears stand out when we pump this stretch up a little bit. Yeah, I'm loving that. Okay, save exactly a scene. 12 minutes is too long! <laughs> Stop live stacking. Oops, I saved under the wrong name. Look, it still said M103. If I change that, it doesn't go back and retroactively change it now, does it? <laughs> M76. No, it doesn't. Rats! Okay, let's go grab that real quick because that's misnamed. Um, desktop. Change the name of the M103 that we just captured. M103 on this night. Boy, it's ugly there. And make that M76. And get rid of this one and this one. Okay, those are straightened out. Okay, change the sequencer to next target. Um, the beauty of having this event being shared around the globe is that if we miss a target in one time zone, our brothers in the next one can hopefully get it. Well said, Frank. Uh, Chris says, and where do I have to apply for a clear sky for that night? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, man. That is a great question. I think that must be with some power higher than the one that Frank and I have. <laughs> I think that's with God. You have to pray hard. Let's go back to our planetarium software and click this done and go to M34. Now, I like the way this targeting list is working in Starry Night Pro. Notice how it has changed because I used to use Astro Planner uh, and 
it has made it simpler, hasn't it? I have one less program to have to go look at. M34 is an open cluster, it looks like, so this will be quick. We're still in this rich field part of the Milky Way, seeing lots of stars there. There, did you see those snap? See how when that Starry Night Pro Plus image, when we get to the resolution that it, that it wants and it just downloaded, it snaps those stars into high res where it just streamed those in. It's an amazing, it's an amazing piece of software uh, that, that they've got all that automated, that it starts working on downloading that next resolution photo. Uh, back here, wow, that's already visible, isn't it? And this is M103. Let's just change to our start imaging and we don't have to save very many frames of this at all. Um, so instead of being limited to the 11 hours of night sky, we have literally expanded our individually night, individual night skies to include everyone's night sky. <laughs> That's right. And Tom says, sound great. Frank says, ultimately, we will have multiple images from multiple observers entered in the sheet. Doug, will you choose the best one for the final submission? Right. We'll probably do some kind of jury and we'll figure out how people can vote. And maybe we can make it a blind jury. Mike, Jerry, it's M34, not M103. Wow, that's great. Thanks for catching that. Let's change that. And it lets us change it now, doesn't it? Yes. Thank you, Michael. You're on the ball. Uh, let's just make that sky a little bit more alive like Mike does. See, I don't like that as much in a Rasa. Uh, at least the way I've got this one tuned. I just like the sky to be more jet black, especially when I've snuck up the mids like that. Okay, that's good enough, huh? Uh, let's just read about this real quick because uh, show info. Open cluster. An easy naked eye cluster under dark skies. M34 is the apparent size of the full moon. It is best seen through binoculars or under low power and telescopes. The cluster contains about 60 members. Yeah, that's what I would have guessed. Including several double stars. A bright optical double star lies at the cluster center. M34 is moving in the same direction through space as Pleiades and a handful of other open clusters. Wow, so we got a cluster of clusters. How about that? So I'm going to stick that window there, and then when we go back over here, that window stays up there so we can read and image and observe all at the same time. See, we can go more new observation, and we can look at the live image on our left and then uh, write about it on our right and say, yep, about 60 members. Um, this is beautiful, but its beauty is a bit masked by the rich star field behind it. You see what I mean? In other words, there's not a, as stark of a contrast. That's what I'm trying to say. This is still a beautiful cluster, but there's not as stark of a contrast because of the fact that the star field is so rich behind it. And this is M34. So I'm just going to grab this and save as I mean, really, this is like allowing you to do your cropping instantly. M34, 20, 20, 201. Did I already do this? 
or was that that's where it saved it this is three minutes Doug I've been putting that three minutes haven't I over here I should be consistent okay and that's putting that in the right place um, stop the live stack next target choose the file doesn't remember the folder from where I get the files each time which is kind of annoying and I want this one and now that I've imaged it I'm gonna say done look we're ready for M45 what optimization are you thinking of got to figure out how to optimize the ASI air for the marathon you guys will have to talk about that because I am ASI air blind um, I mean completely ignorant of ASI air Pleiades slew to Pleiades back off here run to the 178 put the telescope on top so we can see in the electronic viewfinder you can see the telescope and where it's lewd so it's looking over to the left that's like up in the west above the light dome of Louisville so we're seeing the light dome of Louisville here and now we're back here and sure enough looking at the Pleiades that looks like a decent framing um, let's go back over here to the it's a little bit vertical ish isn't it but we'll we'll put up with it uh, M 45 isn't it it's not correct M 45 um, Start imaging. Uh, it clears it, doesn't it? Now we know for sure, because did you see at the beginning, it still had the 11, and then it went to zero. So it's clearing it automatically. Kim, I'll be taking some test shots in advance with my William Optics 80 millimeter and ASI Air Pro. Um, Doug has a list he just checks off in order. Nothing like that in ASI Air. Ah, I see what you're saying, Tom. And then Tom says, maybe do Sky Safari. You bet. Sky Safari would work on this. Um, look in Sky Safari the way you can say, are you seeing, let's go to the webcam for a second. Webcam. Yeah, you're able to see that, aren't you? kind of filled with glare but anyway down here at the bottom there is that observe button and then observing lists and you can download from live sky if you haven't already done it messy marathon and it is the very list I'm using that's the very list in fact look how when I make these observations if you if you use if you use Sky Safari's observations, it's tracking real time. Are you able to see that? It's tracking real time the actual observations that I'm making. So for instance, we started tonight with what? I forget where we started. But we've gone M34. Remember, we were working on the little dumbbell. That is the little dumbbell. That's the little dumbbell observation I just made. And that's because Starry Night Pro and Sky Safari are both done by Sim Curb Simulation Curriculum, and they've tied them together with Live Sky. Dot com. The moment you make 
the dumbbell, the little dumbbell observation, that's synchronized with Live Sky. The moment you synchronize it with Live Sky, it synchronizes it with Sky Safari. They all talk with each other. Most plan engineering software allows you to create observing lists. I know Stellarian does. Chris says, I have a small Win 10 PC on my telescope running ASCOM Remote Alpaca, and all the astronomical programs are running on my main PC inside the house. And Chris says, I use Stellarium too. Tom says, nice, going to have to make some test runs. Frank, you've been working on that too, that alpaca stuff, haven't you? Or did you mean you had a live alpaca and you've been harvesting the wool? We'll have to see which you meant. Okay, so I'm gonna make the sky a little bit black or I mean a little bit more tuned to the to the peak of the and then we're gonna pump this up a little bit so we see a little bit of that nebulosity. Let's bring the reds down a little bit. And that way we'll cheat and see more of the nebulosity. At three minutes, we're seeing some, but not all the nebulosity that we would like to see. Um, let's zoom in on some of that. See how we're starting to see this. Um, now this is a reflection going on here. Remember the story People used to think that this was some kind of nebula dust traveling with Pleiades, but in recent years, remember, uh, we've, I say we, the broader astronomical community, researchers have determined that this dust, that Pleiades is actually just traveling through it. So this is just reflection off of the dust that Pleiades is traveling through. But it makes it beautiful, doesn't it? Kind of kind of makes it, I don't know, how would you describe it? Sort of, kind of Christmassy or something. It kind of lights up the night sky with a little bit, doesn't it? I love it. See, when I get it too far like that, there's where I like to be. Jet black night sky and then pump of this nebulosity as high as we can, but not so much that the stars start to bloat that much. Um, Frank says, I need to talk to you, Chris. Frank says, yes. Mike says, you're still on the webcam, dog. Oh, rats. <laughs> Good catch. Thank you, Mike. Well, you know, this is a great, reason for you to come here so you can catch me when I make that mistake. I did that so I could show you Sky Safari. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yes, Chris, you're right. Wrong scene. Yes, Tom, you're right. Still on webcam. We don't know how to describe it because we can't see it. <laughs> Mike. Okay, so maybe that's a little bit too jet black. No, it's not. I really like it to be that jet black sky. Another thing we can do is lower. Let's do another color balance and start from scratch again. Oh my goodness. Now let's decrease the reds a sliver and the blues a sliver. Not much though. And then Move those greens in. Maybe the blue's just up just a hair, right? This is so much art and not just science, right? Oh, that's nice. A little more blue. There we go. Okay, that's six minutes. That's a good start to see the nebulosity. Let's save that as seen and um, that is the thing we want to log on to Notion. Let's go over to Notion and desktop, sharp cap, M45 on tonight. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be a good idea to, when we start working on something,
to go ahead and put our name there so at least somebody knows we're working on it. We can't see any wispiness because the blacks are too clipped. <laughs> I deserve that, Mike. <laughs> uh, Tom says, nice thing about ASI Air is I save all the individual frames for stacking later. I'll admit that is nice. It's sort of like the best of both worlds, isn't it? And that one's done. Okay. So we did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven objects in about an hour and fifty minutes. So we didn't go fast enough, did we? We gotta go faster. We gotta learn to do this faster. By the way, I didn't Oh, it's because we didn't do these. The Phantom and the... We did a couple down here. Anyway, about 11 objects, I bet. Um, Starry Night Pro will tell us exactly. Man, thanks for being a part of this, guys. Uh, we are at the end of our two hours, and I think I am going to stop tonight at 1 a.m. because tomorrow is a full work day for me. But thank you for being a part of this. I feel like it went so fast tonight. We didn't have anything that went wrong, and so that helped us, didn't it? It, it didn't wear on us because everything was working, and this is what we want. We want everything to start working, and I would just be happy with this if it did this the rest of my life. <laughs> so anyway, this is a good trial, the SA Marathon. Thank you guys for pitching in. Um, yes, we can do the same with Sharp Cap. Frank says, Chris, I am me on Cloudy Nights when you can. My screen name is Zephead. I'd like to find out more about your mini PC setup. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to the others that were on there and didn't say hi. You're very kind, Tom, to encourage. We're looking forward to it, too. Don, thank you. So sorry that clouds rolled in. You guys are great. Thanks for being a part of this, and we will look forward to seeing you next one. God bless. Have a great night. Take care.